Hello there. Welcome to the Watchmaker's Apprentice podcast. My name is Garen Fraze, and there is always more to learn about watchmaking, so I will always be an apprentice. This is episode two. If you missed episode one, I talked a little bit about my journey and how I became a watchmaker, you know, what got me here. And uh, this episode, I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on the questions that were asked in my uh, recent Instagram poll. Uh, If you're not following on Instagram, I I post lots of content, short form videos about uh, the work I do and, you know, standard watch repairs in the world of Rolex. A couple weeks ago, I posted a uh, a Q&A on my Instagram story. So I got lots of great questions about that. Um, The number one question I got was about my journey. And that's why I dedicated the first episode of this podcast just to my journey and how I became a watchmaker. And this second episode is going to be all about uh, the, the other questions. I'm going to be responding to as many of those as I can, except the ones about education. I got a lot of questions about education and, and training programs in the United States. I'm going to save those questions for an upcoming episode where I sit down with Stan McMahon, who is my former watchmaking instructor and the current instructor at the horology program in Paris, Texas. So... Uh, Stay tuned for that. I'm I'm very excited about that. It's going to be a great episode. Uh, But for now, I'm going to get to as many of the other questions as I can. And I hope you guys enjoy. And and if I don't get to your question or if you have other questions, you can comment on this video. You can DM me on Instagram. And I will consider those questions for future episodes. I might do another Q&A in the future. I don't know. This is all new to me. I'm still figuring it out. But uh, if, if you guys like it, let me know. Let me know what else you'd like to see, any other topics you'd like me to cover. And uh, yeah, I think that covers all my bases up top. So I'm going to go ahead and get into these questions. So uh, the first question we have is how to regulate mainsprings. Now, I don't know exactly what you mean by regulate mainsprings, um, because if you're talking about hairsprings, that's a whole that's a, a whole podcast episode in and of itself. But uh, mainsprings are, for, for the uninitiated, if, if you're newer to this, more of a beginner, the, the mainspring is the primary power source in a mechanical watch. It's kept in a barrel, and that barrel has teeth on it. So as you wind up the spring, it, it wants to you know expand and return to its natural state. So as it expands and unwinds, it drives the, the barrel, and that barrel basically acts as a gear to drive the rest of the gear train. But um, if, if you're gonna, by, by regulate mainspring, I, I'm gonna interpret that as, how do you get the most power out of a used mainspring? And first of all, a used mainspring should only ever go back into the watch that it came from, first of all. Second of all, um, there, there's two things to take into account when you're reusing a mainspring. First of all, is it set? If it's if it's like set to the point that it's all like one coil, that's bad and you should replace the mainspring. But if it's more of like an S shape, uh, that's that's good. You you want the S shape that that curve provides more power uh, and and more steady power over time. So so that's the first thing you want to look for. And then the second thing you want to ensure is that the mainspring is flat in comparison to itself, meaning you can set it down on your workbench or another flat surface, and there's no gaps between the the spring and and the bench. It's all completely flat all the way around. And so the way that you would adjust this is um, you find the the point where it's the most out of flat, and then either using uh, using your you know your fingers while you're wearing finger cots, or you can use tweezers and 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 whatnot. You bend it past its moment of elasticity so that uh, it doesn't spring back to the same spot and and basically bend it little by little until it's perfectly flat and you can flip it over and it stays perfectly flat. Um, And then at that point, you reinstall it into the mainspring barrel. But you got to be you got to install it in the 
barrel correctly. You you don't want to wind it by hand because because springs are made of a steel alloy, which is much harder than brass, which is what most of the barrels are made out of. So if you're if you're winding it in by hand and just like pinching it in piece by piece into the barrel, the the mainspring itself can scrape and scratch the rim of the barrel, and then that's bad for two reasons. One, the rim of the barrel is no longer consistent, and so it's not going to clamp the lid as as tightly and as securely. And two, those brass flakes can can now get into the movement, get in between the the barrel and its arbor, and and create wear over time. So uh, you always want to use properly sized mainspring winders. Uh, get yourself a good set. It's worth investing the money in, and uh, uh, use the mainspring winders to properly install the mainspring into the barrel. Next question, how do we send you a watch for repair? I get this question a lot in comments and in my DMs, people are, are asking to send me watches. I gotta be honest with you guys, I don't have room in my shop for more watches. Um, I'm the only watchmaker in the company and I am taking work from three different locations. So I'm up to my ears in Rolex work as it is. I don't have room to even work on any other brands. And I, I, I can barely, you know, keep a, a decent turnaround time only servicing watches for the existing customer base of Haltoms. So I, I really appreciate the, the trust that you guys put in me just based on the, the videos that I produce. That does mean a lot to me and I, I don't take it for granted, but I'm sorry I cannot service your watch. I, I just don't have time, unfortunately. Ironic, isn't it? Are you trained to work on any brand? Kind of. I only have official training from Rolex, but uh, with the education that I have, I understand the fundamentals of, of watchmaking and watch repair enough that I, I can work on most brands. Um, it's just it's really just a matter of parts. Uh, on, in my free time, I like to work on vintage stuff, and my interest more and more is antique American pocket watches. Uh, I think they're really cool. It's a, a really unique niche within the horological industry. And uh, I don't think they get the love they deserve. They're, they're really gorgeous watches. So um, am I trained? I'm educated to work on any brand, but I'm not trained to work on any brand. Uh, and, and there's a big difference. I, I, I wouldn't work on modern luxury watches from uh, other brands that I can't get parts for simply because I can't get parts for them. Um, and because I, like I said earlier, I don't have time. But uh, in, in my free time on the weekends at home, uh, I, I do work on you know vintage watches and, and stuff. I've got a collection of my own that I maintain and service. So yeah, am I trained to work on any brand? Kind of, sort of. Tips for adjusting a watch like COSC. So if you don't know, COSC is the uh, chronometer certification. In any watch that is a chronometer, which means it's, it's, it's got more strict tolerances than other watches, that is independent, independently tested in Switzerland by a company called COSC. Control Official Suisse de Chronometry, but with French pronunciation. In English, it's translated to Official Swiss Chronometer Testing Institute. Uh, but tips for adjusting a watch like COSC. This truly could be its own uh, series. This could be weeks and weeks worth of podcast episodes. But uh, to break it down to the basics, I would just focus on the, the eight fundamental things that can affect isochronism. Um, I, I do want to make these podcast episodes as beginner friendly as possible. So if I mention isochronism, that means I've got to define it. So isochronism is the property of an oscillator in this case, in, in watch case, a balance wheel, the property of an oscillator to maintain stable oscillations, no matter the amplitude. What's amplitude? Amplitude is the measurement in an angle of how far an oscillator, whether it be a balance wheel, a pendulum, like on an old clock, amplitude is the angle at which it travels. So the, there's, there's a handful of things that can affect isochronism that can cause a watch to run differently at different amplitude levels. So I'll, I'll list them real quickly and then I'll, I'll go through each of them and how, how you can compensate for those eight effects in the workshop or certain effects are compensated for uh, at the at the point of manufacturing. But those eight effects are friction, external influences, uh, magnetism, temperature, regulating pins, escapement, poise of hairspring, and poise of balance wheel. 
So friction, the, the very first one, that's the enemy. Um, over time, the lubricants in a watch dry out. So um, that's, that's one way that friction can compromise isochronism. Also, if, uh, if, if like bits of, of dust and debris get into the watch, that's friction. Basically anything that impedes the flow of power uh, creates friction. So as a watchmaker, cleaning and regulating to reduce that friction as much as possible is very important. External influences can be shock, it can be uh, uh, water getting into the case, it, which, which causes rust and, and reduces friction and, and even, even trace amounts of water, like just a drop. <clears throat> Let's see, what else? Um, yeah, dust and debris, anything like that. Those things can, can definitely affect uh, the, the running of a watch. And most of those things are, are, these days at least, accounted for at the point of manufacturing. So shock is accounted for on, on the smaller um, on, on smaller pivots like the balance wheel and escape wheel. Some Seikos have shock protection on all of the wheels, which is pretty cool. But um, what, what you can do to prevent external influences from affecting your watch in the shop is uh, replace gaskets on every watch you service to ensure that it uh, passes the water resistance test up to whatever uh, it's it's uh, graded to whether it be 50 100 meters 200 meters 300 meters and test it like make sure that it actually passes those tests um, and then let's see the next effect magnetism demagnetize every watch uh, during the service process that's that's a big part generally when a watch becomes magnetized it runs faster temperature is is compensated for at the point of manufacturing so you know, if a watch has, if a watch doesn't have temperature compensation, it's probably not going to pass COSC certification tests, uh, and you can't really do much about that in the workshop. Uh, let's see. Next is regulating pins. Make sure that the regulating pins are perfectly parallel to one another, and make sure that the regulating curve of your hairspring is directly centered between those pins. Uh, and uh, if you have a free sprung balance wheel, which is a, in my opinion, a better solution than regulating pins. You don't have to worry about the regulating pins because they don't exist. But you do have to worry about the escapement, the poise of the balance, and the poise of the hairspring. The escapement adjustment, making sure that the unlocking force is, is low enough that you supply sufficient power to the balance wheel, and making sure that the locking depth of the stones is sufficient so that uh, overbanking is, is uh, accounted for is very important. The poise of the hairspring and the balance is probably the most important thing for, for timekeeping. So it, it's very important that you make sure that the hairspring is perfectly flat and perfectly center as much as, as you can get it. And then only when all seven other things have been accounted for, all, all of the other effects of isochronism has been accounted for, then you can focus on the poise of the balance. and and. That's, a, that's some pretty advanced watchmaking um, theory that you can get into on poising a balance. But uh, long story short, you want to make sure that the weight of the balance wheel is evenly distributed so that there's not a heavy point dragging the, the balance wheel down. Because if there's a heavy point on the balance wheel, when, when that point is lower towards the center of gravity of, of the Earth, the hairspring has to work harder to overcome that to bring it back to the, the dead point. So make sure that the eight effects of isochronism are accounted for and you will be able to get the most out of whatever watch you're servicing, whether it was initially rated for cost tests or not. What do you charge to replace a Rolex case tube on 16233? That is a Datejust with a sapphire crystal, steel and gold fluted bezel. Great watch, by the way. Love, love that watch. See a lot of them coming through the shop, um, affectionately known as your granddad's date just. Oh wait, this is the front. I have I hope that doesn't affect the audio quality because I've been talking to the back of the microphone this whole time. So like I said, guys, this is a learning experience, okay? Uh, cut me some slack, you know what I'm saying? Anyways, uh, yeah, so, so replacing a case tube on a, uh, a reference 16233 would be included with the cost of an overhaul. So it, it costs, really, it, it costs nothing to you if, if it needs a new crown tube. Now, if, if you brought it in and there was nothing else wrong with it but the crown tube being stripped, uh, I would have to check the crown itself to make sure that 
the crown itself is not stripped as well. But uh, I, I think that you're looking at anywhere between like uh, 50 bucks or 250 ish, if that's all it needs. But if you're getting a complete overhaul, that'll be included in the cost of the of the service if it needs a new crown tube. Where should someone start as a hobby? Um, I'll, I'll mention the first part of this question is how did you get into watchmaking? Go watch episode one. Second part of this question is where should someone start as a hobby? Now, my first instinct when someone brings up getting started in watchmaking as, as a hobby is well, there's a lot of demand in the industry for watchmakers. So why not <clears throat> why not get formal education and go into the field and, and have a rewarding career? Um, what's like what's stopping you from that? And if there is something stopping you from that, that's totally fine. I'm you know, I, I, I don't wanna, you know if if you've already got a great career that, that is satisfying and you're just looking for a hobby, I, I get it. But uh, truly if if you're interested in watchmaking and don't have a career that 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 you're passionate about already there's lots of demand in the watchmaking industry truly but if you do want to just get started as a hobby my advice is work on your own watches because you will break something it's it's inevitable even even at school with the best equipment and the best instructors you're going to break something it 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 happens so i would say uh, invest in good tools and invest in a few decent project watches um, use movements that are common easily serviceable stuff that has a reputation for being easily serviceable I would recommend you start with an Etta 6497 or 6498 that's kind of like the blueprint for for a mechanical watch um, and and you can get them for you can get Chinese clones for like 50 bucks uh, and and that's perfectly fine for for hobbyist stuff just getting the basics down um, but yeah, I would I would like piece together a a, a, f a f decent toolkit or uh, go through the AWCI or HSNY. There's there's some great like uh, a starter like like intro to watchmaking, watchmaking 101 type courses uh, that that uses 6498 as the blueprint for for those types of uh, like like build a watch classes and stuff like that. That's a, as good of a way as any to get started. If you're doing the, the build a watch courses from AWCI or HSNY, or I think NAWCC also has some, and I, I'll, I'll link all of these uh, institutions below, uh, all these organizations, I'll, I'll put them in the description. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in getting into watchmaking as a hobby, I, I would really recommend one of those classes because you get instruction from a professional watchmaker with experience they'll be able to answer a lot of the questions that you are going to have and yeah like i said use your own watches because you don't want to break you don't want to take on the liability of someone else's watch whether it be you know a 50 dollars seiko or a two thousand dollar longines or whatever it may be uh, you just don't want that liability look into beginner courses from uh established horological institutions and use your own watches how long is an apprenticeship? Uh, that depends on the master and it depends on what you want to do. And also if you're considering an apprenticeship, I would say look into formal education instead because it's hard to find a, a watchmaker willing to take on an apprentice. And if you do, they're probably going to be so busy with other work that they hardly have time to teach you and instruct you. Uh, in, in the way that you really need to to have a good career as a watchmaker. That's not to say that it's not possible. I know some great watchmakers who who started as apprentices and, and they do wonderful work. But I, I would really recommend formal education and training because that is a more uh, secure route to a stable, steady career quicker than an apprenticeship. What are Rolex requirements during certification in terms of quality of work compared to other brands? Um, and it cuts off there, but I, I want to make a quick caveat. There's, there's not Rolex certification. It's Rolex authorization. Uh, I'm not certified by Rolex in any way. I am authorized to work on their product and I've received training from them, uh, and, and passed bench tests and all that. So, so you're, you seem to be asking more about the, the quality of work. The measurable way to look at quality of work is how quickly can you do work and, and how does that watch look on a timing machine once you're done. So, so Rolex is uh, not so wrapped up in, in 
how quickly you're doing it, although that is certainly a factor. Um, they're more focused on the rate of the, 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 the rates that the watch is running at when it comes out of the service. And, and they measure the rates in five positions at two power levels. This is actually uh, a 6497 build that uh, that I'm I'm using for. I hope you guys can see it, but I'm using this to teach my girlfriend who is is about to be going to school at PJC for watchmaking. Uh, I'm teaching her the basics using this watch, but this is going to make a great demonstration for uh, for talking about Rolex's rate tolerances. So so what Rolex does is they measure the watch in um, in five positions. They'll do dial up, dial down. Then they'll do three high, six high, and nine high. They don't measure 12 high because because the watch, in theory, doesn't spend a lot of time sitting at, at 12 high, at, at 12 in the, in the up position. So um, they, they use those five measured rates uh, to, to get an average rate across those positions. And then they measure it at full wind and they measure it at 24 hours after full wind. To ensure that the the lower amplitude, because there's lower uh, after after 24 hours, there's less torque coming out of the mainspring barrel, and so you're gonna get lower amplitude. So that's how you ensure isochronism over a, a 24 hour period. You you measure at zero h or full wind and minus 24 h or half wind, even though it's not technically it's not always half wind. Um, but Rolex's tolerances are. Um, it has to be within plus three minus one as an average rate between those five positions and two power levels. And it also has to have no, the, the, the delta or the difference between the highest and the lowest rate can be no more than 12 or 15 seconds, depending on the model. So I hold myself to the same average rate tolerance, but in six positions over two power levels. And I also hold myself to a delta of 10 seconds, no matter the model that I'm working on. Now that can be challenging and, and there, I'm not going to lie and say that every single watch that's left my shop was within 10 seconds because I did have some that were in, in the 12 second range and that's fine. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to beat myself up over that. But uh, these days uh, I can't, I can't remember the last time I sent a watch out of the shop uh, when the, the delta was greater than 10 seconds. So. Compared to other brands, uh, most most luxury brands are pretty pretty similar in terms of uh, their their rate tolerances. There are some who measure in three positions because they don't have enough watchmakers and technicians to service the quantity of watches they have and measure them in five positions. So when the quantity of work goes up and they don't have enough watchmakers who can do the work, the the uh, acceptable tolerances tend to go down, which is unfortunate, but you know, th they gotta do what they gotta do. So that's that. Have you ever visited Switzerland? No, but I'd love to. Uh, it's definitely on the bucket list. Where do your orders come from? Are you an independent watchmaker? No, I work at a jewelry store, uh, Haltom's Jewelers in Fort Worth, and my orders are, uh, well, my, my work comes from the existing customer base of Haltom's Jewelers. What is your age and what was the thing that made you start doing watch repair? I'm 23 right now. Um, the thing that started me doing watch repairs was a, a pocket watch from my grandfather. That's what, what really got me into it. And if you wanna learn more about that, go watch episode one. I've got a great question about books for self-education and I can touch it briefly, but I'm gonna revisit this question whenever I have Stan on the podcast. Um, I will say, the, the one mistake when it comes to books for, for beginners that I see people make is they buy this book and they think, oh, this is going to teach me everything I need to know about watchmaking. But the problem with this book is that it's not for beginners. This book is for people with like five, 10 years of experience as watchmakers or, you know, engineers and machinists who know their way around lathes and mills and, and things of that nature. There are definitely some some sections in Watchmaking by George Daniels that uh, are helpful for beginners, particularly his his uh, his chapters on um, the evolution of the escapement and his description of the Swiss lever escapement. I think that's really good stuff. I read that section of this book while I was in school doing the escapement theory section of the program. So there's there's some good stuff 
for beginners in this book, but it's not for beginners, and I can't iterate that enough. Uh, you'll be lost, you'll be confused, you'll be scared, you'll be you'll be hurt, you'll run and hide from watchmaking if you start with watchmaking by George Daniels. But I, don't let that deter you. You know, if you're interested and and want to learn more about uh, George's approach to watchmaking and just want to see some really cool technical drawings, it's a great book. But I wouldn't use it as like a, a introduction to watchmaking. I would, however, I would recommend these two Henry Freed books. These were my textbooks at Paris Junior College. The Watch Repairer's Manual by Henry Freed and then Bench Practices for Watch Repairers by Henry Freed. These two work great as a pair. Um, I'd, I'd say start with Watch Repairer's Manual and then uh, graduate to Bench Practices. But there's, there's some great information in these books. I will say some of the information is a little bit outdated, like terminology-wise. Uh, they were written, I think, in like the 50s. Uh, but like I said, great information. Some of the practices in here I will recommend that you take with a grain of salt because uh, you should never touch watch components with your bare fingers unless they're being cleaned immediately afterwards. Uh, your fingers have oil on them and the materials that watch components are made out of uh, rust and and are corroded very easily by your your finger greases so anytime you see uh, an illustration in this in these books of someone holding a component with their bare fingers don't do that uh, either wear finger cots hold that component with a pin vise or some other some other sort of uh, retaining mechanism because uh, rust is an external influence that can affect isochronism. And if you touch watch components, they will rust. So that's that's my quick uh, book recommendations. I'll also say Theory of Horology is great. I've got a copy around here somewhere, but it's uh, that's, that's the textbook for most watch programs, watchmaking programs. Uh, it's a little bit more dense and it's definitely in you know the theory side of things. That, that will help you to understand why watches work but uh, watch repairs manual and bench practices for watch repairers will help you understand how to work on those watches. So that's a good quick introduction, but like I said, I'll, I'll revisit that question with Stan because he has, he has the, the recommendations. He's got the book recommendations for you. Oh, speaking of which, I, I will recommend Stan's oiling booklet. This is great for, uh, uh, it's called The Practical Guide to Modern Watch Oiling by Stan McMahon. You can find it on eBay. Uh, you can buy it directly from Stan and, and support him. Uh, it's, it's really a great, great book. It's, it's concise. It tells you everything you need to know about oiling and, and lubricating a watch and nothing more. So, yeah, highly recommend uh, a Practical Guide to Modern Watch Oiling by Stan McMahon. Okay. How does one become a watch designer? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not a watch designer, so I can't really help you with that one. I know there's a program in the UK, I think Birmingham Jewelry School, something something like that. There's there's some watch designing programs in Switzerland, and I think there's one in the UK as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not a watch designer, so I can't really help you. I repair and restore watches. How many percent are you satisfied with your job? I don't know that I'd rate it on like a percent scale. I'm, I'm certainly satisfied with my job. I, I couldn't think of a, a better way to start my career as a watchmaker than servicing Rolex. It's it, They're truly some of the nicest watches to work on. It's great, uh, great work. Haltems is awesome. They, they're, they're really supportive and they've been very supportive of this content creation that I'm, that I'm doing. So I'm, I'm very satisfied with my, with my work. Um, what's the hardest watch to repair? I don't know because I haven't repaired all watches, but I'll, I'll give you the hardest scenario to repair. The hardest scenario is, is when a watch comes in for service and it hasn't been serviced for, say, 20 years. And the person that serviced it 20 years ago didn't do everything quite as well as they could have. Maybe they didn't care as much or they had too many watches to work on and, and, and because of that, they're their quality control slipped a little bit. Um, whatever the case may be, those watches have the most problems. Um, worn out parts, uh, broken jewels, uh, worn out jewels. Um, the, the lubricants have long, long, long since expired at that point. And the watch has been running dry until the point that either the mainspring breaks 
or something else breaks and it, it's just no longer functional. But uh, yeah, that I would say is the hardest watch to repair, at least the hardest scenario to repair regardless of the watch. So SP hand engraving. Hi, Paul. Uh, Paul is a, a very active member of my Instagram community and he does some really cool hand engraving work. So if you're interested in hand engraving, go check out his page. He asks, what's your thoughts on aftermarket dials that do not have feet? Paul, I hate to disappoint you, but a dial with no dial feet is no dial at all. Um, there, there's not enough securing the dial to the movement to ensure rigidity and stability should a shock occur and, and you know, shift things. Uh, dial feet, for those who don't know, are, are on the back of the dial, there's, there's these little posts that, that go into the movement and then are either clamped or screwed down and held in place. Uh, if, if it's just a flat dial blank, uh, like, like is used for, for hand engraving dials, um, it's, it's generally stuck on with like two pieces of uh, uh, adhesive of some sort. And there's a, there's a couple of issues that can come up with that. One, the watch goes too long without a service and the adhesive fails and, and then the, watch is, the, the dial is just loose. That's one. Secondly, um, a shock can occur that exhibits enough force on the dial to separate it from, from the adhesive, to break that adhesive, and then that dial is loose and it can scratch the movement, it can scratch the hands, uh, it can create flakes of, of dust, shave, flakes of metal shavings and, and bits that get into the movement and, and cause all sorts of issues. So what are my thoughts on dials that have no dial feet? That's not an acceptable dial to put in a watch. What do you think about Gégé Le Coutre Vogue-Matic? I'm a big fan of JLC. Uh, I think they, they make great watches. Vogue-Matic is super cool. If I remember correctly, that's like a, an ultra thin, actually I can look it up. Uh, I'm thinking like ultra thin dress watch, maybe? Vogue-Matic. Yeah, Vogue-Matic is like a, a rectangular um, ultra thin dress watch. Yeah, that's cool. I like it. Yeah, I think I think anything from JLC, like you're not going to go wrong. They're, uh, there's a reason that they have the respect and admiration that they do. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of JLC. Vogue-Matic looks like a really cool dress watch, man. Thanks for the question. Average Rolex service cost on a watch that hasn't seen a service for a while. Well, according to Rolex policy, the amount of time between a service doesn't affect the, the rate that I charge. What does affect the rate is if there's uh, major components or, or um, uh, uh, visual components that need to be replaced. So this is like bezel, uh, crystal, dial, hands, um, crown, and then like larger movement components like bridges, uh, uh, any, anything like that, a balance complete is, is more expensive. But the, the average cost comes out to around a thousand, give or take a couple hundred. Um, and, and that's pretty, that's pretty standard, I think for, uh, for, for a Rolex service from, from an authorized dealer with genuine parts. That's, that's a, that's a, a caveat to, to add favorite watch slash movement to work on. Love the IG excited for the YouTube videos. Thank you. Super B suave. Um, I, I really love servicing Daytonas. There's, there's some interesting challenges, uh, that, that come with servicing a more complicated movement like a chronograph. And I think the way that uh, Rolex overcomes some of those challenges with the execution and design of the Caliber 4130, which is what I work on most of the time, it's, it's just such a, a cool movement to work on. I, I, I really enjoy doing the Daytonas. So Golden Goblet Mead asks, what is your favorite watch component? And I would say the bridges because uh, the, the bridges, for those who don't know, are, are the plates that kind of hold uh, the gears and everything else in place. I love bridges because the, the way that you can um, execute the decoration and the hand finishing on a bridge is, is really what takes a watch, at least for me, from, hey, that's a mechanical device to, wow, that's a piece of art. So, so for me, I'd say the bridges are, are my favorite component. And that, that probably is because uh, I, my, my first exposure to, to watches was old American pocket watches with the demaskining on the bridges, which is like the, these intricate patterns 
that are are almost engraved into the the surface of of the bridges and i just think it's so beautiful so thanks for thanks for the question mitchell that is a friend of mine and he is soon going to be starting a mead company so so go follow golden goblet mead on instagram i am hesitating to do a training of four years at rolex in geneva should i do it yes the industry is dying for more watchmakers i encourage you to uh to you know join the industry what movements do you recommend beginners to practice on uh great question i i mentioned earlier the 6497 6498 those are those are great beginner movements uh, if you want something automatic, the the twenty eight twenty four or Salita SW two hundred is another great movement, uh, very serviceable. Lots of parts available, and then if you want something a little more f affordable, I, I think Seikos are great. A lot of people don't like working on Seikos. Uh, I can't under I don't understand why they're they're fun. Uh, they are a little bit trickier than than some uh, more expensive Swiss counterparts, but but they're they're great movements, and and I I really do like Seikos. Uh, let's see. I think that just about covers everything. And this has been, what, like 45 minutes now. So, yeah, I want to say thank you all for, for the questions. Thanks for participating in this little Q&A. And thanks for watching the podcast. I'm still trying to figure out uh, how to make a podcast. But uh, we're coming along. We're getting there. Uh, let me know what type of content, what type of topics you'd like to hear me cover more. And um, like I said, I've, I've got some guests that I'd, I'd really like to bring on and, and talk to. And, and that's all in the works. But for now, uh, this is what you got. So enjoy it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the continued support on Instagram. Uh, yeah, keep on ticking in the free world. No, I can't, I can't steal that. I can't do that. Thing. I can't steal nardwar's thing i what, what am i doing what am i talking about i can't even i can't even stop a podcast the right way thanks guys